This week's parasha is called Mishpatim, which means laws or regulations or judgments. And it begins in Exodus 21, 1 and goes to 24, 18. And uh, it's really a good part of it is a summary of civil laws that are given to Israel. And some are found almost word for word in other ancient Near Eastern uh, law codes. But one major difference that is in the other law codes is that there's no mention of holiness. And it's not about the respect of human life. For example, in the Code of Hammurabi or other ancient Near Eastern codes. Uh, there's no freedom for slaves in uh, the other law codes. Uh, and the law of retaliation, lex talionis, uh, 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 an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is really taken to the extreme as far as punishment. It goes far beyond what scripture says. So sometimes when we read the, the law, uh, which at this point follows immediately after the giving of the Ten Commandments, we get lost in the forest for the trees. You know, we see all these details and try to figure out the details, and some of them are, are difficult to read or to understand. Uh, but as you take a step back, even though uh, many of the judgments on the offenses that are committed are deserving of the death penalty. When you look from a distance, you realize that what God is doing is actually protecting human life. And not just human life, but even the animals, because anyone who hurts, injures animals also uh, receives the judgment of God. So the Mosaic law is not based on, on uh, trying to prohibit or limit freedom, it's actually uh, designed to give freedom. And I don't know about you, how often you think about the law or laws, we don't really think about them because we have a good system of law in this country, therefore we are free to go about, we're free to worship, we're free to, to live our lives, and uh, so we don't have to think about all the details of the law. Even though there are consequences to people breaking the law, and, uh, but when you look at the, the Mosaic law, it really is based on grace and not based on punishment. And judgment is not the, the, the highlighted feature of the Mosaic law. It's not about punishment. It's really about the love of God. God loves us enough to really show us where the boundaries ought to be in every situation, in every relationship. So that's, that's one thing that as I looked at a lot of the details that have to do with uh, uh, kidnapping and cursing parents and accidental killing and um, the goring of someone by an ox, uh, practicing witchcraft, bestiality, sacrificing to idols and all of these things. It's really uh, God wants to protect our lives from all of these things. So he said don't do this in order that you may live really. And so it's a really, it's a gift from God that we have uh, the Mosaic law and the law in general. Uh, in talking about the uh, law of retaliation, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, we normally hear just the first two, the eye and the tooth, but scripture goes beyond that. It talks about burn for burn, wound for wound, blow for blow. And the rabbis actually developed that into 24 organs of the body that would apply under this law. And so anything you injure in anyone uh, is, uh, uh, comes under this law. Uh, then another thing that we see here is the treatment of uh, what is often translated slaves. And in our minds when we hear the word slave, we don't normally hear the word servant. But in Hebrew there's only one term, eved. And so the eved is a servant. So when you read in scripture about the treatment of slaves, think about the treatment of servants. It's much more uh, human in the way we look at uh, people who serve others and there's a big difference between the treatment of Hebrew uh, servants and what we think of when we think of slavery. In a lot of cultures slavery uh, comes with brutal treatment. It comes with uh, uh, preventing people from living a free life, uh, with cruel cruelty. And but this is not what Scripture tells us. 
uh, in the Mosaic law. The, the slaves or servants are to be treated properly, given the opportunity to be set free. And uh, we can see that some of these situations were good situations because many of them decided to stay with their master. And uh, if they chose to do so, to stay there, then there was a mark. And we read in scripture that you go to the doorpost and bore a hole. Well, when we think of boring a hole, we think of boring a hole. And, but probably put an earring in the hole, you know. I remember when I got my ears pierced, wasn't that bad, two cubes of ice and life went on. And, um, and so, so it's not, what is described in scripture is really to protect those who are serving and to protect the male servant, the female servants, although the treatment's a little bit different uh, in those two, yet it, it is really nothing like what we read in the Greek and Roman literature about the treatment of slaves and servants. Uh, God has set up a system in that whoever is employed is a servant of someone should be treated properly uh, by the slave owner. The terminology in the English Bible is difficult sometimes, but really it's by the, the, the employer and the employee. It's much more of that kind of relationship than it is uh, slavery in the way we think of it. A third uh, portion that um, is highlighted for me uh, really stood out in this passage is found in chapter 22 and a little of it in chapter 23 where we have the treatment of foreigners and widows, orphan and the poor. And uh, it really comes out in this passage that God treasures uh, the foreigners, those who are in your midst who may not come from your community. And uh, let me read to you verse uh, chapter 22, verse t uh, 20 and 21, then I'll go to chapter 23, verse 9. It says, You must not exploit or oppress an outsider, for you were a gear, an outsider, a foreigner, for you were outsiders in the land of Egypt. You must not mistreat any widow or orphan. If you mistreat them in any way and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. My wrath will burn hot and I will kill you with the sword. So your wives will become widows and your children will become orphans. And the next chapter it says, Do not oppress an outsider, a gear, for you know the heart of an outsider, since you were outsiders in the land of Egypt. So the, the importance of uh, treating every, everyone as uh, one who is created in the image of God, whether they are part of the community or come from outside of the community. And I read in a commentary, uh, I'll quote, it says, Love of the alien is something unknown in ancient times. The Egyptians frankly hated strangers, and we see that in the book of Genesis, in the story of Joseph, that the Egyptians would not eat with the Hebrews and probably did not eat with other foreigners also. And the Greeks coined the infamous term barbarian for all non-Greeks. The love of alien is still universally unheeded in modern times. Leviticus 1934 expressly demands in regard to the stranger, thou shalt love him as thyself. The Talmud mentions that the precepts of love or not to oppress the stranger occurs 36 times in the Torah. The reason for this is constantly repeated exhortation for those who have been downtrodden, uh, for the treatment of those who have been downtrodden frequently prove to be the worst oppressors when they acquire power over anyone. So really, be careful. You have been outsiders. You have been oppressed. So now that you are free, don't take advantage of this, uh, of this freedom in order to oppress, oppress other foreigners. Also, it says the rabbis explain this term, lo tone, do not uh, uh, oppress, to mean that nothing must be done to injure or annoy him or even by word to wound his feelings. I like that. And I'm from Canada, so don't wound my feelings. <laughs> and, uh, but the, how serious it is. And it's interesting that the treatment, God says, my wrath will burn hot against you if 
you mistreat the foreigners. And we live in a time when there are a lot of questions that go through our mind about immigration, about refugees, about all these issues. And so what is the main thing that God wants us to think about is, first of all, that everyone is created in the image of God. And we need to respect whatever legal issues there are. Everyone needs to be respected uh, who is here in our midst and lives here in our midst and that's, uh, that's important. I don't see elsewhere here where it says the wrath of God will come against and kill with the sword. It's a very severe, uh, severe punishment. Then in the passage uh, in the parasha, we also have the, the mention of the three harvest festivals uh, when the, uh, the men were to go to uh, offer sacrifice and go to Jerusalem, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot, which is really three wonderful times of the year to be in Israel and to be in Jerusalem or to be in any Jewish community and really seeing the Passover celebrated, the exodus out of Egypt remembered uh, in a, a powerful way as we're going to do in the, in a month or so. And then Shavuot, Pentecost, we, and we read Acts chapter 2, and we see the, uh, the amazing, uh, you know, swelling of the population in Jerusalem, which still happens today. It's really fun to be in, uh, in Jerusalem at that time of the year and probably other cities. I'll let Dr. Uh, Goldstein address that one. And, uh, but really the celebration and then Sukkot and also uh, people really coming together and celebrating the protection that God has provided. Then the uh, next portion has to do with uh, the promise to go into the land, that God will be with them, that he will drive out the enemy. And most of the time in scripture it talks about driving out. It doesn't, start, uh, it doesn't talk about killing them all. And uh, so uh, that's a whole nother sermon. But uh, most of the time God, but what we see is that God wells, welcomes even the Canaanites in the, in the midst of the uh, Israelite community. First, the first one they encounter when they come in the land is Rahab. And so everyone has the opportunity to respond to the message of God lo uh, God's love. And some people did uh, who were uh, from outside. So they were not all driven out for sure. The next uh, part of this parasha has to do with a covenant ceremony. After they've had the Ten Commandments, then they've had the fleshing out of some of these laws. Then there's a real interesting uh, uh, organized uh, covenant um, yeah, ceremony that is described there. First, you have the reading of the law before the people. Second, you have the covenantal response from the people. And it says, all the words which Adonai has spoken, we will do. And we've, we heard that actually in the last parasha in uh, chapter 19, where the Israelites say everything that the Lord uh, says we will do. We also read about that in Joshua chapter 1, when God speaks to the, uh, or Joshua speaks to the Eastern tribes, say whatever uh, uh, the Lord says and whatever uh, we will do. We will obey the Lord. Lord, which is based on the book of Numbers, when God said they would go and help their brothers. Then you have the building of an altar and an offering sacrifice. And in this case, you have the sprinkling of, of blood on the congregation. Then you have a theophany. You have the elders, especially, are in the presence of God and they see uh, the manifestation of God. And then what do they do? They eat and drink. <laughs> so I thought, okay party time after in the presence of God and so I believe that God calls us to rejoice and we often have opportunity with our own eggs to really it's not just food it's really celebrating uh, God every time we come together the last portion is a portion that I'm going to chant and it has to do with Moses and Joshua going up to the mountain and the manifestation that we see with the cloud and the fire, and these are things that we saw already in the book of uh, uh, Exodus, where God manifested himself uh, in the cloud, in the fire, and so it is the presence of God. And what I loved about this is that when you look at the, the uh, occurrences in uh, the last parasha in this one, is that whether you're on the mountain or in the valley, you can see the presence of God. And I was thinking about that in our lives. Sometimes we're in the valley and we need to look up because the presence of God is always there. 
God never leaves us, never forsakes us. So whether on the mountain or whether in, in darker times, uh, God is always present and he can always be seen if we look up and uh, he will manifest himself. Amen.